Hello, my name is Diego Apeyani, and in this course we are going to learn the basics of Caramba 3D, which is a plugin for Grasshopper that allows the user to perform a structural analysis of both beam and cell structures in an interactive and parametric way. We will learn how to use this powerful and flexible tool by creating and analyzing different structural systems, so we understand them and we will be able to incorporate them in our actual structural designs. We will start with an apparently simple beam and then we will move on to trusses and wall and slab systems. So let's get started. In the first chapter of this course, we are going to define a simple beam to start getting to know Caramba before jumping into more complex structural systems. So the first thing we have to do, of course, is to define the geometry of our simple beam which could be a line in Rhino. So in order to do that, let me get the line SDL component here. We basically have to define the start point, which I'm going to do with a grasshopper panel like that. It would be the point um, zero, 00, of course. And then we need to define the direction, which is going to be the X axis. And finally, we have to define the length of our line, which uh, will be eventually our beam. And we are going to use a slider for that. So if I type like 0, 0.00 and then three dots and then 10, I should get a slider that goes between zero and 10. So now if I create this component, we can see that we have created our uh, line in Rhino. So we should be ready to start defining our uh, Karma model out of this simple uh, <laughs> grasshopper geometry. So let's get back to our um, Karma toolbar here. And I usually start my Karma definitions with the following component, which is assemble model. Here it is. So this component is basically the one who is going to create the Karma model out of uh, different inputs. And I like to start this way because here we can see which inputs needs Caramba in order to create the model. And we are going to start off with the elements, which is um, basically a uh, random geometry to which we have to assign certain mechanical properties. For instance, we have to convert our line into a beam. And for that, we need another Caramba component, which uh, we can find also in this uh, first toolbar here model, which is line to beam. So if we use this component, we have to plug the geometry here, in this case, the line, and we should be getting a beam, which we can plug into this component right, uh, just like that. And we can see that this is a Caramba element. This is um, not a runner geometry anymore because we can connect the output of these Caramba components with a grasshopper panel. So if I do that, then I can realize that this is no longer random geometry, but a beam with a certain properties. So we can check the start and end points here. And furthermore, we can see the cross section that has been assigned to this beam element. But of course, we haven't defined any kind of cross section yet. So Caramba is assigning the default cross section, which is a, a pipe cross section with a diameter of 114 millimeters. But of course, we want to assign our <laughs> own cross section to our beam structure. That's what we are going to do right now. So let's come here to the next toolbar cross section. And with this first component cross section, uh, this is the one that we use to define custom cross sections. And there are more components here in the lower part of this toolbar, but we would uh, be using them in order to read predefined cross sections from a certain library. So in this case, let's assume that we want to create a concrete beam. So we would define a custom cross section. If we would be using like um, steel profiles, we would probably use uh, these components here to read them from the Caramba library. So let's get the cross section component into the canvas. And the first thing that we realize is that there are uh, different cross sections to choose from. So the first three ones 
are uh, eye sections or pipe sections, they could be uh, more appropriate for, let's say, uh, steel beams. And then we have uh, cross sections for shell elements, shell constant and shell variable, and even for um, reinforced concrete. And finally, we have springs, but now we are looking forward. Uh, we are looking for this cross section here, the trapezoid one. And in this case, since uh, we are using a rectangle, we have to define the same parameter for lower and upper width. But before doing that, <laughs> we have to uh, take a look into the description of this parameter and realize that these dimensions should be specified in centimeters. So let's specify like uh, 20 centimeters for the width of our beam. And we are going to specify uh, 60 for the height. Okay, and now <laughs> we are going to take a cross section here. And of course, this is a rectangle and so on and so forth. But we have to also define the material that we want to apply to this cross section because otherwise, Karama is going to apply the default material, which is still 235. So, in order to let me put this down here. So, in order to define the material, we have to come. <laughs> we have to come to the next toolbar here, and again, we have different options here. So, the first component, material properties. Um, it uh, we would use this component in order to create custom materials. But in this case, we want to use a predefined concrete material. So, for that, we are going to use the material selection component. Right, like that. So now we have to, to um, click here into select and you can see that we can see that an extendable um, panel appears and we can select family, concrete and name. In this case, we are going to select concrete C3037, just like that. And <laughs> we can connect the material to our cross section, the cross section to the uh, beam element and that should be everything about our beam element. And of course, there are uh, several other input parameters that I'm not going to review one by one, but please feel free to explore them if you want to. Okay, so the next thing that we need to define in our Karma model are the supports. So basically, we need supports because <laughs> we need uh, our, to prevent our extractor from uh, freely moving like a mechanism so that we can calculate it. And uh, in this case, since we are going to define a beam structure, we are going to apply supports to both uh, endpoints of this line. So the first thing we need to do, of course, is to get the endpoints of our original line with the endpoints component, of course. So here we go, and we get the start point and the end point here. And now we need the following Caramba component, which is basically support. <laughs> so we get the support component, and here we can see that we have to specify two things. First, the location of the support, and then we have to specify the degrees of freedom or the directions in which we are going to fix our support. So let's start with the start point of our beam. And we are going to, um, of course, we are going to lock or to fix the translations in each direction. And then let me copy this component because we also need to assign a support to the end point of our line. And in this case, I'm going to lock the uh, translations in the, along the C axis along the uh, y axis as well and however i'm going to release the x axis so in the longitudinal direction it is going to be free so that the beam can deform in this direction without any kind of constraint so it seems like we are done with our supports but <laughs> we need to define uh, something else which is to lock the rotations along the x axis because otherwise the beam uh, <laughs> would be able to rotate without any kind of constraint. So now I think we are done with our supports and we can connect them to the assemble com model component here. Okay, like that. 
And uh, we have to take care now because when we are connecting several inputs to the same uh, parameter of the assemble model component, we have to check that it is not a true structure because uh, this component works just with lists. So in this case, we realize that it's a list, okay, but to make sure, I strongly recommend to flatten the inputs of uh, all, uh, all parameters that are getting information from several grasshopper components. And now we should define our loads here. So for that, we have to get this component here, the loads component. And there we go. So the first thing that we realize is that there are different load types to choose from. So we have gravity, which would be, of course, the uh, self-weight. Then we have point loads, imperfection loads, and so on and so forth. And uh, first, we are going to define the self-weight of our beam. And for that, we uh, can optionally specify a vector, which this is the, and this is the factor that um, we are going to multiply the gravity with. And in this case, we are going to leave it like that because we are going to use the default value of the gravity. And then we have to specify the load case that we are going to assign this load to. And we are going to start with the load case number zero. And I recommend we to start with the number zero and <laughs> not number one, because Caramba is going to uh, create a load case number zero by default, regardless of uh, whether you define it or not. So this should be our first load. Let's connect it to the assemble model component. And then we are going to define a uniform line load. So let's get the loads component once again. And we need to define uniform line. Okay, so now we get more um, input parameters here. And uh, in this case, we are going to define the um, load case number one. So let's start from the bottom to the top, <laughs> from bottom to top. And uh, now we could define beam IDs, and this could be useful in case that we uh, were assigning like uh, different loads to the different uh, beams of our structure. But in this case, since we have just one beam, <laughs> we don't need to worry about this input parameter. And finally, we have to specify the load that we are going to apply. But before that, we have to decide the orientation in which we are going to apply the load. So by default, uh, this option is selected, local to element. So what does this actually mean? In order to uh, understand that, you should uh, take a look into the Karama manual, which uh, you can find under um, manual.karama3d.com. And then if you come to this uh, section here, oriented pin, you can uh, see, you can realize which is the orientation of the local axis that Caramba assigns to beam elements. And uh, you can uh, read the whole document if, if you want to, of course, but uh, to sum up, uh, this really depends on the orientation of our beam element, whether it is vertical, horizontal, it is inclined, and even the direction in which the line was created. So to sum up, this is uh, quite a sensitive approach, I think. So in most of the cases, if you are dealing with regular structures, you would probably want to apply the loads along the global axis. So this here is the global rhino axis. And in this case, we want to apply the vertical load. So this would be along the C axis. And we are going to define a load uh, of, let's say, um, 10 kilonewtons per meter. And of course, in order to um, know which units Karama is expecting, we, uh, you can just uh, take a look into the description of this input parameter, and there we go. We realize that Caramba is expecting the load in kilonewtons uh, per meter. But before <laughs> before connecting the our load, we realize that the C axis is pointing upwards, and we want to apply our loads, uh, of course, <laughs> pointing downwards. So we have to uh, reverse the orientation of our load vector like that with the reverse component and now we should get a vector which is of course pointing downwards and that should be it we connect the load here and we flatten also this uh, input parameter and finally we are going to define another load 
which is going to be a point load. So let's get the point load. And um, the load case is going to be the load case number two. And the position. So we are going to apply the load in the, um, let's say, in the free support. Because if you remember, we define the support so that it can move in the uh, x along the x direction. And we are going to define the, the load as an horizontal load. So it basically tries to elongate the beam when we apply that load. So of course, let's get the endpoint. This is our this is our location, and we have to specify the load. So this will be along the x-axis, and the load will have a value of 100 kilonewtons. So just like that. This is our load, our location, our load case. And I think that that could be it. And now we have finalized assembling our karma model. So this is our karma model. And now we have to calculate it. So uh, in order to do that, we have to come to this um, toolbar here, algorithms. And you can see <laughs> that uh, it can be overwhelming how many components we have to analyze our model. But in most of the cases, unless uh, you are dealing with a very slender structure, we are uh, you should be using this first component here, analyze. And you can realize that this icon has a number one here because it means analyzed uh, with a first order theory. So we connect the model and that's it. <laughs> so we have just uh, calculated our model, although <laughs> we, can, we cannot uh, realize it through the Rhino viewport. Um, but we are not getting any kind of uh, warning or error, so I think everything is uh, fine uh, so far. And what we can do, though, is to take a look into some uh, general results in through the output parameters of this component. So first, we have the displacements in centimeters. So this is basically the maximum displacement of our structure. We don't know the in which direction. We just know the, the maximum value, and of course, we get three values because we have defined a three load cases in our Karma model. So this is like a, an interesting check to see <laughs> whether you have defined uh, your structure um, right or not, because if you um, get like a null value for your displacement, it would mean that you have probably forgot to apply the load, and if you get a very big value, in that case, uh, you should check that you have applied the right cross section or the right uh, kind of support and so on and so on. And besides that, you also get the resulting force of gravity. And in this case, it's, it, uh, um, it refers to the load cases for which we have defined a gravity load. In this case, that was just our um, load case number zero. And finally, you have another parameter here, elastic energy which you probably <laughs> won't be using a lot. Okay. And the great thing about Karama is that it has very interesting options for displaying the results graphically into the Rhino viewport. So, uh, but first, before jumping into these uh, <laughs> Karama components, let's set a beam length of 10 meters because otherwise we are not going to be able to uh, see very much. Okay, so basically, now we have to jump into the next uh, toolbar here, which is the results toolbar. And there are three main components for displaying results in a graphical way, which are model view, beam view, and cell view. So let's start with the model view component like that. So basically let's expand this uh, panels here. So basically we can use this component to display the deformation and reaction forces, and also to graphically display the inputs of our Karamba model. But first thing first, <laughs> what uh, we have to do before doing anything else is to select the result case that we want to display the results from. And in this case, let's start with the load case number one, which was the uniform line. So now, first, uh, let's let's get back here. So we can see that, of course, we can display the deformation. So we can see that there's something happening here, and we can activate and deactivate the deformation this way. And then we have some uh, this factor here, the scale factor, 
and uh, this number basically means how much I mean how much we are exaggerating the actual deformation of the beam. So in this case, it means that the deformation that we are seeing in the Rano viewport is actually 50 times bigger than the actual deformation of our model. So in this case, this would be like uh, 50 times 1.1 centimeter. And of course, we can uh, vary this slider. And if you do, uh, if you make double click into the slider, you can also set a precise value if you want. Okay, so that was the formation. Then we can also display the reaction forces like that. And since we have a line load of uh, 10 kilonewtons meter and the beam is 10 meters long, the total reaction force could be 10 by 10, 100 kilonewtons, and divided by two, we get a reaction force of um, 50 kilonewton in its support. And then we can also display the loads, of course, and we can display the supports, and this interesting information as well, because, let me hide the reaction forces, because we uh, are getting here which um, degrees of freedom we fixed uh, when we defined our supports. In this case, we see that uh, for this support, we, we, are fixing, we were fixing the um, translations in the three directions, along the three axes, and also the rotation along the, along the X axis. And um, in this uh, other support, however, we just fixed the directions, I mean the displacement along the Y and Z axis. So if you remember, the beam is uh, free to deform in along the X axis. Okay, then we can also display the, the local axis, of course, of our beam, as we are seeing in the Karma manual. And we can also display joints in case that we define um, any in our Karma manual, which is not the case. Then we are going to leave the render setting by settings by now. And another interesting option is the tags here. So first we have the node and element tag and element tags. So basically, these are the numbers that Karma is automatically assigning to the points and elements of our model. And this might be very interesting information in case that you get some error from Karma and you want to uh, <laughs> to see where the error is happening. Okay, then we have element IDs, but uh, so um, we could have defined some identifier as a text here for our beam elements, and then we would be able to display it with this model view component. But that was not the case. And now, however, we can also display cross-section names. And this is very interesting because in order to do that, of course, first, <laughs> first we need to specify the name of our cross-section here, and that's what we are going to do. And we are going to use the concatenate component for that. So we get this component, and we are going to concatenate the dimensions of our cross-section. So the width always comes first, and then the height. And in order to specify a separator, we have to make double click into the component, and we specify X separator. So we can see that now we are defining this uh, name for the cross-section, which is of course 20 by 60. And uh, this is very interesting because in case that uh, we want to change the dimensions of our cross-section, we can see how the cross-section name is also changing. But even more important than that is that the deformation uh, is changing as well. So, of course, the dimensions of the cross-section have a certain influence into the deformation values. So, let's take a closer look into this interesting result here. So, in order to get the actual value of our deformation, of course, we have to come back to the analyze component here. And since we are dealing with the load case number one, we should get the um, item number one of this list. So let's get the list item component here. And there we go. And now let's define a slider between zero and two. There we go. And now we're interested in the deformation of the load case number one, which we're going to display into a grasshopper panel. 
like this, perfect. Okay, there we go, this is our deformation, 3.7 centimeters. And we are going to use this uh, numerical result to analyze the uh, influence of assigning different cross-sections to our beam structure. So we are going to start off with a beam element of 20 by 60. And remember that uh, we are specifying a length of 10 meters for our beam. And now <laughs> what you just have to do is, for instance, try to guess what happens if we make the height of our beam uh, twice as smaller as it is. So if we make this value 30, now you should have to guess what happens with the total deformation value. Now we have 1.1. So if you were guessing that we would get like a 2.2, twice as much, you were wrong because actually we are getting <laughs> a deformation which is eight times bigger as the original, than the original deformation. And what's the reason for that? So to explain uh, some structural components, I'm going to um, use this uh, book, which is called Faust Formal. Um, it is a German book about conceptual structural analysis. So basically, if you come to this uh, page, it says here that the deformation is closely related to the bending stiffness, which is basically the product of the young modulus and the uh, moment of inertia. And the young modulus is related to the material of our structure and we are not changing the, our concrete material in this case. And the moment of inertia is related to our cross-section. And if you come to this part here, you can see that the moment of inertia of our rectangular cross-section uh, is this formula here, which is the width multiplied by the height to the power of 3 divided by 12. So in this case, if we make the height twice uh, as smaller as it is, actually, the moment of inertia is also uh, is going to be 2 to the power of 3, like 8 times smaller. So we get a bending stiffness, which is 8 times smaller than the original one. So that's the reason why our deformation is 8 times bigger as the original one. But uh, let's get back to our cross-section of 20 by 60. And now try to guess what happens if we make the cross-section twice as uh, wide as it was originally. So now in this case, the deformation is just, of course, uh, twice as smaller as it is, because if you remember, the width was just uh, specified to the power of one in the formula of the moment of inertia. Okay, so now we are starting to understand the influence of uh, assigning a particular cross-section to, uh, to our structure. And however, let's take a look to the load case number two which was, of course, the uh, point load applied into this um, free support here. So if we display the load value like that, now we realize that the reaction force is 100 kilonewtons, and this reaction force actually is happening in the other support. That's right. But now what I wanted to say is that apparently we are not seeing uh, any deformation here and the reason for that is because the beam is actually becoming just a bit longer but it is not deflecting in the vertical direction so the total deformation is like 0 0.01 not uh, very high apparently but regardless of that let's uh, get the deformation result of our load case number two and let's try to analyze the influence of changing our cross-section dimensions. So now, however, if we make the height uh, twice as smaller, which is 30 centimeters, now the deformation is going to become exactly twice as bigger as it is right now. So in this case, 25, uh, 0 0.025 centimeters. So if we come back to the fast formal book, we can see that when we are applying loads along the direction of our structure, we um, are dealing actually with the uh, axial stiffness of our structure. And the axial stiffness is the product of the jump modulus and the uh, cross-section area. So the jump modulus, once again, is related to the material, and we are not changing our material, but the cross-section area, in this case, since uh, we are using a rectangle, it is the width multiplied by the height. So, of course, if we make the height twice as smaller, the um, cross-section area, and therefore the 
axial stiffness as well is twice as smaller so that's the reason for getting a deformation twice as big so let's get back to the cross section and with the width it happens the same so it is it becomes twice as small as it was before then the deformation becomes becomes twice as bigger as it was okay so i think that now we are <laughs> done with analyzing the influence of uh, applying different cross sections to our beam in terms of deformation values and uh, okay to finalize uh, with the options of this component we can also display um, material names but we haven't specify that of course and let's get back to the load case number one and in order to um, understand this uh, structure better we can even hide the original line so we do right click here preview off and now it's more clear i think okay there we go and also we can display eccentricities we don't have any eccentricity load values like in this case of course um 10 kilonewtons meter and also uh, the elements of course and this other option that we are not using okay so i think that was it regarding the model view components so now let's move on to the next component which was the beam view component so we use this component to display let's say more advanced or more specific results regarding beam structures and it is very important that we connect this component after the beam view component just like that so the first thing that we realize is that we are displaying the cross section of our beam which of course was 20 by 60 and the reason for that is that we have the uh, cross section option selected here but uh, <laughs> besides that we can also realize that we are displaying the cross section of the deformed beam which means that the options that we set with this model view component in this case the deformation scale factor also affect the uh, results that are being displayed from the beam view component and for instance beside the deformation there are another options that are affected as well from this model view component for instance we can also set a color to uh, for our beam structure so in this case we can come back to our uh, link to line to beam component and if we set a color with our swats component of course let's set i don't know some kind of a greenish color and now we set a color here and if we activate the option element color we can see <laughs> how our beam structure has turned green okay fantastic but that was uh, very fun and now let's uh, deactivate the deformation and even the cross section now more interesting than that is that we can display these section forces through the beam view component so let's start with our bending moments but before that what we are going to do is to send set the length of our beam to six meters okay there we go and also we are going to hide the uh, the cross section name so there we go as well so we are saying that we want to display the bending moments and okay so the bending moments uh, related to the vertical loads should be the bending moments around the y-axis of course which is perpendicular to the beam so let's select this option here so i promise you that this is the bending moment diagram which we can control with this scale factor but in order to see the results properly we should also check these two options here field and numbers okay there we go and we can see our bending moment diagram here but before analyzing the results we are going to come back one one last time <laughs> to the model view component and to the render settings actually so here we see this parameter length divided by seven which means that if we modify this slider we are going to display uh, to decide in uh, how many points or uh, in how many points we are going to display our beam forces so in this case we are going to see uh, we are saying that uh, it's uh, 50 centimeters we are going to 
display one, the force at that particular point. And this is very important because in order to capture the maximum bending moment, in this case, you should get a, a result point, in this case, right in the middle of our beam. Okay. Okay, and this is our bending moment of um, 45 kilonewtons. And besides bending moments, we can also display, if you want, um, uh, the, the CR, of course, our CR force along the C axis. And what else? And of course, if we change to the load case number two, what was related to the uh, point load, in this case, we should be getting also a certain axial force of 100 kilonewtons. Okay, that makes sense, but let's get back to the to the bending moment of uh, 45 kilonewton meters for the load case number one. Okay, there we go. So why we are getting 45 uh, kilonewton meters? So since we have a simple supporting pin, you might remember that the bending moment um, comes from the formula load multiplied by the length to the power of 2 divided by 8 and in this case we are getting 45 kilonewton meters okay so that's interesting and with other results we can get from this component we can also display axial stresses so if we check the axial stresses option here and we should probably um, deactivate or hide our bending moments, we can see that this new diagram appears. So these are the axial stresses of our um, beam. So first things first, <laughs> red, the a red color mean, uh, means uh, compression forces or compression stresses and a blue color means in caramba, uh, let's say tension stresses. Okay, but in order to analyze this result better, we should display um, them also numerically through a legend. So let's get the legend component here. And we are going to uh, connect the parameter C with the letter C and the legend T with the letter T. And let's expand this guy here. So perfect. These are the values of our stresses in kilonewtons divided by square centimeters. And this other parameter, uh, this is like a rectangle that you may specify if you want to display the results not just in Grasshopper but in the random viewport as well. So if we specify a rectangle here, you can see that you can um, show the results in Rhino, but we're not going to use that option. Uh, so let's analyze these uh, guys here. So actually, okay, so we see that the stresses are have the same value both in compression and tension and we can see that compression forces have a negative value and tension forces have a positive value and a blue color and furthermore the value is the same and the reason for that is that we are using a symmetrical cross section and we are not applying any axial force at least in this load case and uh, the reason for this particular value is of course if we come back to the fast formula once again, we can see that the uh, formula for the stresses of a rectangular cross section is the bending moment divided by the so called moment of resistance, which has this value here. And in our case, that is the reason for getting, in this case, uh, 3.75 kilonewtons divided uh, by a square centimeters. And remember that we assigned a concrete material for that. And more specifically, we assigned a concrete material. So the quality 3037 means that the compression strength is uh, 30 megapascals and the tension strength is usually more or less 10 times smaller as the compression strength. So in this case, we would get like uh, 3 newtons divided by a square millimeter or 0 0.3 kilonewtons divided by a square centimeter. So if we take that into account, and we compare this uh, strength value with our tension forces here, we can see that the tension forces are bigger than the tensile strength. So in this case, this would mean that our um, concrete beam has cracks here in the lower part due to these tensile stresses, which is very interesting, I think. Okay, and what else can we display with this beam view component? So the next parameter would be the utilization. 
So the utilization is basically the relationship between the stresses or the forces in our structure and the strength capacity. In this case, if the utilization is 18%, means that the forces or the stresses are five times smaller as the strength capacity of our structure. And of course, if the utilization is bigger than 100%, it means that our structure has failed. But in this case, how actually, where do this uh, precise value come from, this 18.18? So basically, let's display the axial stresses once again. The utilization is the relationship between the axial stress and the strength capacity. We can see that the, that the elastic strength or, or uh, yield strength is in this case 2 kN divided by square centimeters, which is of course a 3 of the concrete uh, 3037 divided by the safety factor of 1.5. But anyway, if we divide in this case the axial stress of uh, 0 0.375 divided by 2, we come to a util uh, utilization of 18%. So that's the reason for uh, these utilization values. And finally, we can also display the displacements. And yeah, that could be it. We can also display the number of phases by cross section. But those are basically the results that we obtain from the beam view component. Okay, so we have already taken a look to every possible result in every possible way of uh, <laughs> this beam structure. And now what we are going to do is to take a look how we can influence these results by changing the input parameters of our beam structure. So for that, let's get back to our bending moment diagram. And the first thing that we can do is to change the support conditions. So if you remember, we let the rotations along the y-axis free in both end supports. But however, if we fix these rotations, we can see how we are modifying the bending moment diagram. So let me perhaps hide the cross section. Okay, let's get back here. So now you can see that we are getting negative uh, bending moment values in the supports because of uh, we fix the rotations and that affects our bending moment diagram, of course. And this is very interesting because the uh, maximum bending moment is now 30 unlike the 45 kNm that we are getting. And of course, if we take a look into the um, axial stresses values, now the maximum axial stress uh, takes place, of course, now in the, in the support. So you can see that the red and blue colors are more intense here now. And we have blue in the upper part, which means that we have tension in the upper part of our beam and compression in the lower part. But besides that, we can see that the uh, maximum stress is lower than um, three, that the than the uh, zero point uh, three seven five kilonewtons square centimeters that we that than uh, that we are getting before, and furthermore, the uh, this uh, stress value is also smaller than the zero point three kilonewtons square centimeters that was the that is the tensile strength of our concrete. So in that case. If we were able to uh, fix the rotations of, of our beam in both supports, we wouldn't get uh, cracks in our beam, So, which I think that uh, is very interesting. And uh, furthermore, if we come back to our beam, we can check that the result is right, because if we uh, take a look to the maximum negative and positive values, so if we add uh, 30 and 15 kilonewton meters, they add up 45, that uh, was the original value for a simple supported pin. Okay, and the next thing that uh, we are going to take a look to is the following one. If we come back to the FASFOMEL book, we can see that actually if we change the cross section of our beam along the length, we can also influence the force diagrams that way. So for instance, that would be the force diagram for a beam with a, with a regular cross section. But however, if we make our beam thicker in the middle, we get another kind of diagram and also uh, in the other way. If we make our beam thinner in the middle, we get this kind of diagram and so on and so forth. But 
let's take a look into it in our Karma definition. So basically, before starting creating that uh, Karma model, let's take a look to our original line to beam component. And here, we realize that we can just specify one cross section for our beam element. So we cannot actually specify a varying cross section for it. What we have to do though, is to divide our beam element into smaller elements and assign a cross section to each one of them, of course, with different heights, in order to be able to simulate a beam with a varying cross sections. So this is what we are going to do. We are going to divide our beam in uh, 10 segments and we are going to assign a different cross section to each of them. So imagine if we were uh, modeling a beam with cross sections varying between 20 centimeters high and 100 centimeters, then we would assign a different cross section to its uh, point of our beam structure that way. In this case, this is a linear increment from 20 to 100. But the question is, how are we going to get these values, these intermediate values automatically from our grasshopper definition? And the answer for that is using the graph mapper, which is a tool that I really want to use because we can use it to display different kind of diagrams. And for that, let's choose in this case the graph type linear, which is the most simple one. So we have an input parameter and we have an output parameter. And we have this line here that we can modify and it is going to affect the results. Now, basically, uh, we have to provide a numeric input here and we are going to get a numeric output. So now what we have to specify is the location of our beam in which we want to get a height value from and then we will interpolate that with this graph. So since the input values have to be between the interval 0, 1, what we have to do is to assign a different number, of course, from 0 to 1, to the different intermediate points of our uh, beam. There we go. And now this is not multi-lane data. And if we connect it to our uh, graph mapper, now if we take a look, the first uh, input value is almost um, is zero. So now if we enter here on the x-axis with zero, we should get 0 0.2, which is happening. And if we enter with uh, 0 0.2, then we should get like 0 0.3. And yeah, that's right, 0 0.28, 0 0.28, almost that. And that's what is happening with this graph mapper component. Okay, but now the thing is, of course, that this is uh, interesting, but we want to get our up values not between 0 and 1 in this case, but between 20 and 100. So in order to modify these output values, now we need to use the remap numbers component like that. So what we have to do is to get the uh, original input values and then the source interval, the source domain is going to be between zero and one, of course, as we can see here and the target, we have to construct a new domain for that. Uh, there you go. And the domain in this case is going to be between 20 and 100, as we were saying before. And now, if we take a look to the results, we see that our, <laughs> our values are now between 20 and 100. And we can also affect that with, with this diagram here. So if we change it the, the way um, this uh, line is um, displayed here, now we get the maximum value 100 at the beginning, and we get the value of 20 or the minimum value at the end point. But if we come back to the fast formula, we see that <laughs> we don't have actually a linear progression from the start point to the end point, but from the start point to the middle, and then from the middle to the end point. So then we should define the, our input line this way, from zero to one in the middle, and then from one to zero in the uh, final location and then until zero at the end point once again. And this is not multi-lane data. So if we plug it, uh, if we replace our original list, we should be able to see that in this case, now we are getting the maximum value at the end points and the minimum value in the middle. And of course, 
if we uh, invert this graph, we are getting the opposite, the minimum value at the end points and the maximum value in the middle. Okay, so now it seems that we are almost done with our graph mapper, but if we um, get back to our line to green component, we see that actually we are assigning the cross section to the whole beam element. So perhaps we should deactivate the last part of our Caramba definition to see more clear what we are going to do, which is basically, as we are saying, to divide our curve in this case in a 10, sorry, into 10 smaller segments in order to assign a different cross section to each one of them. So these are going to be my uh, smaller beam segments. This is my original curve and these are the parameters in which I have to divide my beam. Okay, so now we are getting here 10 line segments and what I mean is that we cannot assign a cross section at the endpoints of each segment, but what we have to do is to actually define um, a cross section for the whole segment. And what we are going to do, okay, this is an approximation because in theory, this could be what we would like to do. But now we are going to the average between the cross section at both uh, endpoints and we are going to assign that value to our cross sections. So actually, these are the, the 10 values or the 10 cross sections that we should uh, create in. So, which means that we have to replace the, this list once again. Okay, there we go. And like that, like that, perfect. So, and these are our values. And actually you realize that we are not reaching the minimum value that we would uh, theoretically want to apply, but this should be approximate enough. And uh, otherwise you can always specify a bigger number uh, of uh, subdivisions here. But I think that should be enough. So let's uh, move on. Okay, so let's define our Karma model finally. <laughs> so let's get our line to beam component once again. And these are our beam elements, our 10 beam elements. And now, of course, we have to specify the cross section. So what we are going to do is to uh, get the graph mapper uh, right here. Actually, I'm going to copy it. I'm going to delete the output values and then I need to define my uh, cross section. So let's get back to Caramba, um, the cross section component. This was uh, trapezoid, if you remember, and the width is going to be 20 centimeters and the height of its um, beam element um, is going to be to come from this graph mapper. So these are our results. Uh, like that and uh, okay so now we should be getting uh, 10 cross sections uh, that's right one for each beam element and we need to uh, define the material as well so actually let me copy our original uh, material component and there we go there we go and this is our material and okay we are done with the cross sections finally and we should be defining um, assemble model component here. So we have to plug the cross sections into our beam elements. And now the elements come to the assemble model component. And I'm going to tell you a trick. We haven't calculated our model yet because we still need to define the, the supports and loads, but still we can take a look to the <laughs> into the inputs with both the beam, uh, the model view and beam view components. Although, of course, we don't have any kind of results, but we can get these components here. And that's right. We can see <laughs> how our um, beam with uh, variable cross sections looks like. So that was it. And uh, we can see that, of course, if we change the, if we invert the diagram here, we get the cross section with, sorry, 
with maximum value at the end points and minimum value in the middle and also we can change the extreme values here like that so let's assign a minimum value of 0 and a maximum value of 100 to see what the results look like but of course now we need our supports and our loads and we are going to steal them from our um, original definition so those are my supports don't forget to flatten the input and i am going to use just the uniform line load there we go so let's get back to our to our new karma definition and this is our karma model but of course we need to calculate it so let's get the analyze um, component here our model this is our calculated model there you go and what we want to do is not to see the deformation but what we want to do actually is to display the section forces so let's display the bending moments there you go actually let's start with a, with a beam with the same cross section so these are our bending moments okay so it's the same than before 30 in the in both at both beam ends and um, 15 in the middle and that's right and now let's try modifying our cross sections along the beam length so let's start by defining a small cross section at both ends and if we do that we can see how the bending moment diagram is very similar to that of a simple supported beam and if we do the opposite thing actually we are getting uh, <laughs> almost a hint in the middle because we can see that we are getting the almost the 45 uh, kilonewton meters at both ends and we are getting almost zero kilonewton meters in the middle of course if we could uh, make like more subdivisions this this value would be very close to zero which if you remember is very similar to what the fast formal was uh, the fast formal in Sullivan, sorry <laughs> was saying for uh, both cases okay uh, i think that the results in karma make a lot of sense but before finalizing this example i want to point out that uh, this influence of uh, changing the cross sections um, is only meaningful when we have a statically indeterminate structure which means if we get back to our uh, simple supported beam that's right uh, this uh, statically determined structure and in those structures changes in the stiffness of our structure don't have any kind of influence into the forces and that's right but however if we uh, and we can see we can try changing the cross sections and we can see that the results are exactly exactly the same but however if we make our structure statically indeterminate by uh, fixing uh, too many degrees of freedom in this case by fixing the rotations here we can see that we can also we can now influence the uh, forces the, the force diagrams by modifying the cross sections of our beam along the length of our structure and i think that this is actually very interesting and to finalize this chapter we are going to take a look not into a straight beam but into a curved beam and we, we are going to see uh, which influence uh, this curved shape is going to have into the results of our um, beam structure so first let's start by um, deactivating the um, of course the this this uh, karma definition and let's try to generate our geometry for the curved beam so we are going to take our original line here and we are going to use the three point um, arc component there we go so we are going to define an arc uh, out of three input points which of course the point a and point T, uh, c are going to be the end points of our original uh, beam and the point b in the middle is going to be located outside of the straight line so let's get uh, that point there 
this is our uh, point in the middle and we are going to displace it along the y-axis so let's get the move component here and uh, there we go and now we need the displacement vector which is going to go along the y-axis and now we need the value of this vector which is going to be between 0 and 5 meters like that so there we go and there we go and hopefully let me see uh, yeah that's right so if we change this slider we can see how we are generating an arc which is going to be the input for our curved beam but however if you remember um, beam elements are made out of uh, geometry lines so we cannot use a uh, so we cannot use a polyline here as input and let alone curve geometry so what we have to do is first to divide this curve into individual segments in order to try to approximate this curve geometry through a smaller line segment that's right so the approach is going to be actually similar to what we did just here so let me copy this com so let me copy these components here to divide our geometry uh, there we go so now we are going to divide the arc here uh, let me put these guys here that's right so this is my original curve now and now we are dividing it into uh, 10 small arches and now we need of course the sorry let's get back to the karma toolbar let's get the line to beam component and now of course the input needs to be a line but actually if we uh, plug the curves karma is going to automatically convert them into a straight line so don't worry about that okay and now we have to define the uh, cross sections so what we need to do now is uh, the following thing in this case we are going to define a steel cross sections so let's get back to the cross section component and instead of defining a custom cross section we are going to get the cross section selector component that's right and instead of, of using the uh, cross-section component to define a custom cross-section, we are going to get a cross-section, a steel cross-section from the library of Karma. So let's get the cross-section range selector. And what uh, we do here is first we select the cross-section uh, family. In this case, we are going to select um, the I profiles and let's get um, IP. That's right. And now the output of this component is actually a list <laughs> which includes all the IP profiles of the uh, library of Karama. That's right. But in this case, we just one, one, uh, we want just one cross section. So for that, we need to use the next component, which is the cross section selector. So with this component, we can plug the uh, cross section list and we now we just need to specify the a name of the cross section that we are looking for in this case let's imagine ip 200 and the output is of course ip 200 so this is going to be one cross section that we are going to use but also we are <laughs> but also we are going to define our uh, let's say a pipe cross section to see the difference between both of them so let's get the cross section range selector component once again and now we are going to use this kind of um, rectangular pipes cross sections and there you go and now let's get the cross section selector once again and the name however this is an error because the component doesn't find the ip 200 but what we are going to look for is actually the component with the same height as the ip in this case let's get uh yeah that's right why not like a 200 by 10 actually so and there we go there we go and here we have our cross section perfect so let's start with the uh, i profile 
and there we go, there we go. So these are our elements. Let's get the assemble model component. And now we need the supports and loads, but actually we are going to steal the assemble model component <laughs> from the previous definition. 